Welcome to week five. We're almost done. We're in the home stretch of our uh, material and really two more concepts left. This week we're going to look at a topic that we sort of touched on with adulteration but get into really a specific area of a type of adulteration and something that requires pre-market approval. And we're talking about food additives, food coloring, and irradiation. In all of our lectures up to this point, we've done an agency by agency look. And because of the unique features of food additives and food coloring, we're actually going to do this by topic. So here in component one, we're going to look at food additives. Component two, look at color additives on their own. And then in the final component, look at irradiation. So we're going to blend what we know about agencies, the USDA and the FDA, as we see uh, sharing joint authority here into these topic areas. One of the themes, again, that should be emerging for you at this point in the course is definitions, definitions, definitions. We always look to start with what are we talking about, both uh, terms that we take for granted and legal terms that may be new. Never assume at face value that you know what a term is when you see it in the regulations or you see it uh, somewhere mentioned if you haven't looked at that definition section. And so here we're talking about food additive. And we've talked about what is food, and now we're talking about what does it mean when we add this word to it, food additive. And really, if we think about this in a non-technical, non-legal term, terminology way, we think anything that we're adding to the food that we're going to eat can be a food additive. So our minds may go immediately to something very chemical and processed and new and te technological, uh, you know, xanthium gum is an example. I didn't realize you could even buy it from Bob's Red Mill to use at home. But xanthium gum being one of those that we've come to see on labels and expect and is one of those chemical formulations. But when I'm making that pasta sauce and I'm adding tomatoes to something or adding basil to something, I've added a food additive to my component. Salts, sugars, that uh, vanilla extract, those vanilla beans, we can think of all of this as being a food additive. And so it doesn't need to be confined to this idea of something very scientific, something very new and technological or technical. It could be a very broad term. And we have the statutory section here on the slide. It was mentioned extensively in our uh, law review article that we had as well. And some, the, the definition we say as the substance that's intended for use of which result or may reasonably expected to result directly or indirectly in becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristic of any food. And this last part, component or otherwise affecting the characteristic of food, we saw there were some court cases around, do we read this as either or, uh, either a component or affecting the characteristic or do we read it together? And what the courts have said is that there must be some effect on the final food product, that we are adding something to stabilize, to uh, add flavor. We have a whole host of reasons why we would add these food additives to it. Emulsification, all sorts of things. So we're having some effect on the final food product. And what we saw in the reading is that when we have this ingredient that is fine in a plastic bottle, and then we put it in a capsule form, if it's a single ingredient, we're typically not going to be talking about a food additive. We get into dietary ingredients, new dietary ingredients. That's a whole other bird and a whole other concept. But for our conventional foods, if we're talking about a single food item, we're typically not going to be in this area of food additive. So along these definitional lines, we have a distinction that we make between direct food additives, those that uh, we are specifically adding to the food, xanthium gum is an example, chocolate milk, when I'm adding that chocolate syrup to the milk, uh, any of those sort of things that we're adding to become a component of the food, those are we, what we think of as a direct additive of the food itself, a food additive. And the readings got into this uh, court case involving food uh, packaging as an example of what we mean when we talk about indirect food additives. And what we really are focusing is on food packaging, food handling, and, and the like. And anything that has that, that reading discusses about that ability to migrate over from the container into the food, 
And probably the best example that we can think of in, in recent memory the past year to two years is this big discussion we've had about um, bisphenol A, BPA, BPA plastics, and, and the big marketing term that came out of that was BPA-free plastics. Uh, you know, that can be an example of how uh, a chemical or an ad a component of the plastic is making its way into the food beverage products. And so that's a, a way to think about this in indirect food additives. And something I should note at this point, a reminder, in lecture one or two, we talked about the uh, jurisdiction for each of these agencies, jurisdiction for the FDA, jurisdiction for the USDA. And what we noted then was that one area where the FDA and the USDA have jointly agreed to share authority is here with food additives. And so when we're talking about these terms, when we're talking about indirect, direct, and what it means to be a food additive, we are including the USDA. And what's unique is that the USDA defers to this food additive amendment, the history of the amendment that's provided in the reading. The USDA defers to that definition. There's no corresponding or parallel definition in the Federal Meat Inspection Act or the Poultry Products Inspection Act. There is this one definition in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that the USDA defers to the FDA and then does play some role in that we'll get into as well. So we are talking about the full gamut of food products when we mention these definitions. So what we learned from the reading and what we want to make sure we leave this week with is there are there is this idea that if you are an unapproved food additive that the product is adulterated and we don't have to get into this concept of poisonous or deleterious may render injurious ordinarily injurious if we deem that it is a food additive and it's not an approved food additive then we have an adulterated product and so that's concept number one that we want to make sure we leave with and concept number two is how do we have an approved food additive and that's what these next few slides are going to get into and we have essentially three avenues, three doors that you can get into the, the realm of approved food additive. And we're, if you've uh, experienced U.S. law in other areas, you've probably heard this concept of grandfathered in, uh, essentially saying anything that existed prior to the en enactment of this law, we're going to allow. And then going forward, anything new created after this date has to go through this process. And that's what we mean by grandfathered in. And you'll hear these referred to as prior sanctioned substances. And it's always kind of funny to look at these because we have to look at the specific date that this amendment was enacted. And it was uh, September 6th of 1958. As you saw in the reading, it took six years of hearings and development for this to come. And it was finally passed on September 6th of 1958. So if you invented a brand new stabilizer, for example, uh, a brand new emulsifier, whatever the food additive may be, on September 7th, 8th, 9th of that same year, then you had to go through another door that we'll talk about. You couldn't go through this prior sanctioned substances. So when we talk about this prior sanctioned substances, we have to be really specific in what we're talking about. And it's anything prior to September 6th, 1958. We can give some examples both on the USDA side and there's a whole list in the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 181, if you're interested, uh, those that the FDA knows about. And you can always petition to demonstrate that there is one that's not listed and, and have it listed if you're successful. But we have sodium nitrate, potassium sterilate. There's a whole huge list of these prior sanctioned out there, but we need to be very specific in that definition. So that's, that's door number one. And we can also get in through door number two which is this concept of generally recognized as safe. And we have uh, this criteria for conventional foods, and we have a similar but different criteria for dietary supplements. So again, even though dietary supplements is a food product, it has some, own, it has some of its own uh, criteria and estab established uh, areas. So for conventional foods, what we're talking about is recognition by uh, experts that there's this history of use Prior to 1958, we're typically going to have some limitations. You know, it's not that uh, 
potassium stearate if that was on the gross side uh, that that was used at all levels but it was going to be at a specific threshold uh, parts per um, you know that we'd be using milligrams whatever we'd be using and we have to stay at that threshold for that use in that food so the gross is very specific when we're looking at history of use as well as on the published scientific evidence so you know records all the way back to Roman times about salt and, and sugars and these different spices so we see these come in as as gross and that's door number two that we can get through and we have to remember that we have these two doors but that nothing is absolutely permanent and so if you're prior sanctioned su uh, substance the reading gets into this that you know it really should be sacrosanct and that these should not be something that's easily removed but they can be removed and the FDA again has to have a very legitimate basis to do this to survive a challenge uh, you can imagine by this point an uh, Administrative Procedures Act challenge if the FDA just said we're taking out X Y and Z products because or, or not because and just and just takes them away so there are examples of uh, prior sanctioned products that were have their approval revoked and the same applies for the gross status if new scientific evidence comes forward that demonstrates the product is no longer recognized as safe then it, it can be pulled and we have a really recent example of that with trans fats the FDA issuing a new statement a new rule saying that based on scientific evidence partially hydrogenated oils are no longer generally recognized as safe and so what that means is that once you are taken out of this door one or door two then your product is still a food additive and so now you have to take your product through door three which can be really challenging if the FDA has already said we don't think this product is safe the burden is really high on that person that wants to use and gain approval for that food additive to clear what the FDA has already said is, is deemed unsafe but I did want to share with you uh, this gross revocal of trans fats partially hydrogenated oils is a clip that uh, gets into that discussion and again if the video quality isn't so good I'll put a link in and, and make sure that we have uh, that to play the ingredients that make cookies and cakes taste better and pie crusts flakier but today the Food and Drug Administration says trans fats are no longer recognized as safe and the FDA intends to ban them Chip Reed caught up with the FDA commissioner, Dr. Margaret Hamburg. Trans fats increase your risk for heart disease. It turns out that they elevate the so-called bad cholesterol, LDL. Will this save lives and avoid heart attacks? This action will save lives. The CDC estimates that if we can reduce the levels of trans fat currently in the American diet, uh, we can probably save about uh, 7,000 people from a preventable death and prevent about 20,000 heart attacks. Trans fat is created by turning liquid vegetable oil into fat. Processed food manufacturers use it because it extends the shelf life and improves the flavor of some foods, including snack foods such as microwave popcorn, crackers, and cookies, packaged soups, cakes, pies, and biscuits, stick margarines and vegetable shortenings, and ready-to-use frostings. And some restaurants use trans fats in fried foods. The food and restaurant industries are doing little so far to resist the ban, noting that they've been voluntarily reducing trans fats for years. In 2003, Americans consumed 4.6 grams of trans fats a day. By 2012, it had plummeted to one gram a day. But the FDA says there is no safe level of consumption. New York City banned the use of trans fats in restaurants seven years ago. More than a dozen other localities followed. In an interview for CBS This Morning, New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who led the charge, said that even the restaurants are better off. They did not do what some people feared, and that was to replace trans fats with something that was even worse. They replaced it with something that was better, and their business is better than ever. 
this isn't the first time the FDA has cracked down on trans fats. You'll recall it was in 2006 that they first started requiring company, companies to include information on trans fats on their nutrition labels. Now this next step, banning trans fats, Scott, could take some time. The FDA commissioner said the companies will have to come up with new recipes, but she wouldn't say how much time they'll get. Chip, thank so you can see, based on that clip, why it would be difficult now that we've pulled the gross status from partially hydrogenated oils and made them food additives, why that approval process would be difficult when the FDA is saying, based on our current science, we say there is no safe level of partially hydrogenated oils. It's not an envious position to be in if you actually want to go through that process of petitioning the FDA to say there is. And so often you'll see that companies will just make a cost-benefit analysis and say it's better to find a food additive that we can, can get approval for or that does have approval than to go through what we'll talk about in the next few slides in the approval process. So again, a reminder, we are talking about the food additive petition process, which is door number three, the third way to get food additive approval. And this is the door all of these that we have talked about are doors that both meat products that fall under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, the Egg Products Inspection Act. All of those areas the USDA has authority must go through as well. And so the Food Safety Inspe uh, Inspection Service shares this responsibility with the FDA for the food uh, safety of the food additives used in the meat, poultry, and egg products, but they will allow the FDA to evaluate the safety under their authority from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and then additives that are proposed for use in meat will receive specific authorization by the FSIS, uh, and they'll make a determination on the suitability of the food additive. So it's a shared responsibility. It begins with the FDA, and then it passes on to the Food Safety Inspection Service. Uh, and, and both have equal say, but I would say for the most part in terms of safety, the FDA is an overriding authority. And this petition process begins with the premise that this food additive is not safe. And it's your responsibility going through the petition process to say it is safe and to clear that hurdle of evidence, that threshold of evidence to show that it is safe. There's a whole process, that process that's set out both in the statute and in the CFR. And it's basically five components. Deceivingly simple when you put it in a list like this. Uh, but really, it can be a several year long process. It is parallel in some ways to the drug approval process where you really have to demonstrate safety, starting with animal safety tests, moving to human safety tests, showing tests uh, often that um, you know involve beyond the amount that you would expect consumed. The only real difference that we see in the food additive and the drug process that the FDA uses is as the article gets into, this is a generic process. So once someone does this, then everyone else is free to use that food additive. So uh, it's in some ways unfair, but you know it is still subject to the patent requirements. So if it is a patented food additive for the length of that patent, you would have exclusivity. But then once that patent expires, uh, that food additive is still cleared. It could still be marketed by other companies. So the two things that are uh, of note, again, providing convincing evidence that the additive performs as intended and is completely safe. And this typically involves additive, uh, animal studies in large doses of the additive for long periods of time. The FDA is really concerned about the chronic use and making sure that if someone overconsumes in the amounts that, of the food additive, that there's not going to be a detrimental effect. So it is a lengthy and difficult process. and. That is why you see the other two doors become so attractive, even if they are difficult to achieve. And the article gets into some of the perils of the GROSS system and the ability to self-affirm GROSS and also to uh, involve the FDA in the GROSS determination. But if you can fit into one of those other two doors, it makes the process a ton easier. But if you have to, and if there's a benefit to doing it, there is this food added petition process. So that's food additives in a nutshell, and what we'll do next is we'll move into color additives.